Good afternoon. I call this oversight hearing to order. Last month, we heard directly from tribal leaders and native health experts on the front lines of the fentanyl crisis that is devastating native communities across the country. We learned about the unique factors that complicate fentanyl response in native communities, such as checkerboard, criminal jurisdiction, minimal data, structural barriers to, resource, for, to resources for law enforcement, prevention, intervention, staffing, and housing. And yet Native communities are responding to the crisis with strength and determination. Promising culturally-based practices and tribally-run dedicated treatment programs and recovery facilities for fentanyl misuse are on the rise and seeing great success. Our hearing last month was important, not just for our work on this committee and in Congress, but also for the executive branch to better understand the situation on the ground and inform our next steps. That's why today's hearing with our federal panel is an important follow-up. We will examine the adequacy of federal resources to address the fentanyl crisis in Native communities from public safety to treatment and prevention. The United States must live up to its trust and treaty responsibilities to promote the health and well-being of American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. And that responsibility includes responding to modern threats, including fentanyl. So I'm looking forward to hearing about how the administration's national strategy to combat fentanyl actively considers Native needs, identifies gaps in resources and interagency coordination, and supports Native-led solutions. Before I turn to the vice chair for her opening statement, I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for joining us for this important discussion. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening this hearing, this second in a series on the fentanyl crisis. Uh, as you detailed at our November uh, hearing, we were able to hear from Native leaders and, and health experts on the challenges that they're facing as they work to end addiction and increase public safety efforts to stop the trafficking of these illicit synthetic opioids. We heard some pretty devastating statistics. Native peoples have the highest overdose, overdose death rates from synthetic opioids when you compare them to other racial and ethnic groups. In Alaska alone, the Alaska Native opioid overdose deaths increased by 383% from 2018 to just last year. This increase in abuse, misuse, and overdoses led the AFN, Alaska Federation of Natives, adopting a resolution last year calling for support and increased resources to combat this epidemic that we're seeing in far too many of our Alaska Native communities. We see calls to actions like this all across the country. Uh, the 2023 National Tribal Opioid Summit recently released a report that includes some recommendations that I hope that we can get into today. As these illegal drugs continue to make their way into our country, we will continue to see spikes in overdoses and deaths. Drug traffickers are targeting our Native communities. I think that's what is particularly hurtful and harmful, is to know that they are specifically targeting our Native communities. They know that these communities are more rural. They know that they're more isolated. They know that there is less law enforcement presence. And they also know that they can make more money off of our Native people. Last month, I noted that a drug trafficking ring targeted hubs as well as smaller villages in Alaska. Some of these communities were relatively big in size, Sitka, Dillingham, Ketchikan, uh, but also small villages, Tyonic, Good News Bay, New Stuyahuk, Savunga, Togiak. These are communities where you have 500 people. And organi organized multi-state um, uh, drug traffickers are seeing an incentive to get to native communities that struggle with a lack of law enforcement. It's unacceptable and and more must be done in response. With the federal panel here, we need to better understand what actions are being taken at the agencies when it comes to investigations, to seizures, and providing resources. We need to know how Congress can better support our federal agencies and Native communities to work together to address this crisis. So thank you all for being here today, and Chairman Schatz uh, for the opportunity for continuing this important discussion. 
Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. Senator Cantwell for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Schatz, and thank you and Vice Chair Murkowski for your important work on holding the second fentanyl crisis hearing in Indian country, and thank you for your comments. I think Senator Murkowski's comments illuminated very well the challenge uh, that we face in dealing with the fentanyl problem specifically in Indian country. Last month, we heard directly from tribal leaders about fentanyl and the need to help protect members from this deadly drug. Today, we will learn the administration and what they are doing to help in the crisis, and I'm glad that United States Attorney Waldruff of the Eastern District of Washington is here. Thank you so much for being here and can talk directly about how it's harming communities in the eastern part of our state. Earlier this year, federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement made huge seizures of drugs in eastern Washington. They prevented more than 100 pounds of drugs, 161 thousand fentanyl, fentanyl lace pills from reaching the Colville and Yakima tribal communities. Last week, Kalispell tribe law enforcement officers seized another 18,000 fentanyl laced pills in Airway Heights, just outside of Spokane, Washington. So make no mistake about it, the fentanyl crisis is a flood of poison entering Indian country and communities. And it is not a crisis that our tribes can face alone. We've heard about tribal leaders and their law enforcement agencies and how they are chronically understaffed and under-resourced. And in eastern Washington, just a handful of officers are responsible for patrolling thousands of square miles of tribal land, and they can't sh shoulder that burden alone. Another persistent issue is the lack of strong and consistent data on fentanyl overdoses across Indian country, and we need to do a good job of understanding that problem. The, this poses a huge hurdle for effectively directing federal resources, not to mention law enforcement and healthcare professionals, if we don't know how to accurately describe the crisis. As tribal communities everywhere confront, confront this crisis, we know that we need more support. Earlier this week, the National Portland Area Indian Health Board released its federal policy recommendations from the National Tribal Opioid Summit held in August. I know that NCAI will look forward to reviewing those issues. And the summit, I thought, was a, a very good cross-section of people throughout the United States who were talking about how this was affecting their particular region. But we need more opportunities to do health and wellness. We need more partnership from the federal government on law enforcement. And we need the tools to stop this product from arriving into our countries. I want to applaud our colleagues who went to uh, China and urged the Chinese government to stop production of the precursors that are used. And I think we've made some progress on that. I know that the president uh, met at a summit in San Francisco and had a similar commitment by the Chinese leader. And I hope that our colleagues, whoever is stopping or trying to stop the Senate provisions of the NDAA, the Fendoff Fentanyl Act, which is literally cracking down on the distribution of drugs by cracking down on the money sources. I know my colleague from Nevada knows this very well, but somehow somebody's trying to stop us from getting this over the goal line. I hope they'll just quit. I hope they'll understand that this is a tool that we need to get past. We need to crack down on these rings. We need to crack down on the money. Those pills that were just held up, this, this is one, one, one package of one delivery happening in our communities everywhere. So the seizure of this product could be greatly enhanced by stopping the trafficking, and we need to pass the Fendoff Fentanyl Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there any other opening statements? Uh, if not, we'll turn to our witnesses. Um, I'll introduce all the witnesses and then uh, we'll begin our testimony. Uh, first, we have Adam W. Cohen, Deputy Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. We also are pleased to have Ms. Rosal uh, the Honorable Rosalind So, the Director of IHS at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We're also pleased to Welcome the Honorable Vanessa Waldriff, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Washington State uh, in um, the U.S. Department of Justice, and Mr. Glenn Melville, Deputy Bureau Director, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Office of Justice Services at the United States Department of Interior. I'll remind you that your full testimony will be made part of the record. Um, please um, 
take no longer than five minutes and no one's feelings will be hurt if you take even less than that. And um, with that, uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, please proceed with your testimony. Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. The late Senator Daniel Akaka, who, as you know, was the first Native Hawaiian to serve in the Senate and chair this committee, believes strongly that the United States must fulfill its responsibility to indigenous peoples. I want to be clear that this administration shares this belief. Since day one, the administration has made record investments to honor the federal government's commitment to tribal nations and native communities. Specific to drug policy, this includes dedicating $941 million over the past three years at a time of unprecedented challenges. Today, we're in the midst of the most dynamic and deadly drug environment we have ever seen. There were more than 110,000 overdose deaths in the United States in 2022, with three quarters involving illicit fentanyl. That's 300 per day, more than 12 per hour. In the five minutes that I'll be speaking with you, we will lose another life to this crisis. And there's a tragic disparity. Overdose deaths continue to climb among native communities, even as the numbers of overdose deaths nationally levels off. Immediately prior to accepting President Biden's appointment to this position some 10 weeks ago, I served for 25 years with the Department of Justice as a career prosecutor, serving under six presidents and 10 attorneys general of both parties. In this role, I took part in the department's response to drug threats spanning cocaine, heroin, and now fentanyl. I've also had a front row seat to the opioid epidemic, serving as a coordinator of our federal law enforcement response. And now as one of the leaders working to synchronize all US drug policy across both public health and public safety, I'm here to say that President Biden and his administration are committed to doing everything in our power to beat this crisis. This absolutely includes ensuring American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian communities have the public health and public safety tools that they need to build stronger and more resilient communities. President Biden's national drug control strategy, which ONDCP leads and, in, and implements, is targeted at two key drivers of this crisis, untreated addiction and the drug trafficking profits that fuel it. Under the strategy and with the bipartisan support of Congress, the administration has taken several historic actions to improve access to treatment and counter the supply of fentanyl. These actions have led to overdose deaths leveling off in 2022 and 2023 after sharp increases the previous three years. The National Drug Control Strategy was developed in consultation with more than 2,000 stakeholders, including tribal communities. In fact, ONDCP has engaged with tribal leaders since the beginning of this administration and has seen up close the toll that this crisis is taking on Native communities. Most recently, Dr. Gupta, the director of ONDCP, participated in the National Tribal Opioid Summit and visited the Tulalip Indian Reservation and the Thana Otham Nation, where families shared with him stories of their loved ones lost and leaders spoke of the challenges that they face in reversing overdoses, treating addiction, and stopping cartels who try to take advantage of reservations as trafficking routes. ONDCP's key grant programs, including our High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program, or HIDA, and the Drug Free Community Support Program, or DFC, work closely with Native communities to disrupt drug trafficking and prevent youth substance use before it begins. This summer, ONDCP met with the Arizona HIDA and the Native American Targeted Investigation of Violent Enterprises, or Native, task force who are working to combat drug trafficking along the shared border between the Thana Otham Nation and Mexico. Dr. Gupta rode along with the Shadow Wolves, a Native American investigative unit assigned to Homeland Security Investigations, who this year alone have helped to seize more than 700,000 fentanyl pills before they could harm Americans. It's clear that tribal nations and native communities are committed to beating this crisis, and this administration is committed to helping them. We urge Congress to pass President Biden's request for $15 billion to support health equity, public safety, and social determinants of health in native communities. And we're calling on Congress to pass the president's supplemental funding request, which will disrupt fentanyl trafficking and strengthen our public health response with $250 million going to tribes and tribal organizations. We're dealing with a historic and unprecedented crisis, and it requires historic and unprecedented resources to match the scale. Your leadership demonstrates that the opioid crisis is not a partisan issue. It's an issue that affects every corner of every community, and that's why beating this crisis is a key pillar of the president's bipartisan unity agenda. 
It demands the very best from all of us. Dr. Gupta and I will continue to speak up about this issue, including at tomorrow's White House Tribal Nation Summit, and we look forward to working with you to help Native communities thrive. Thank you very much. Ms. So, please proceed. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the IHS efforts to combat and treat the opioid crisis, particularly synthetic opioids like illicit manufactured fentanyl in our tribal communities. As the committee knows, IHS is a comprehensive direct care delivery provider, and thus we have been on the front lines of this growing crisis. We recognize the profound toll that the opioid epidemic has taken on our American Indians and Alaska Native people. We are not only confronting medical challenges, but also standing up against the threat of, of our tribal communities. Shortly after this hearing, I will join the Secretary Becerra and other HHS principals to join the Tribal Nation Summit Health out Breakout to dialogue between HHS and tribal leaders. The Biden administration is addressing the devastating impact of the opioid e epidemic on tribal lands by dedicating millions of dollars to strengthen prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support services. In October, the president requested $1.6 billion in supplemental funding for SAMHSA's state opioid response program, and of this, $250 million will be transferred to Indian Health Service to go to Indian Country to meet the unmet needs of of the fentanyl and polysubstance misuse in Indian country. This request underscores the emergent nature of this crisis and the work that we still have to do to strengthen our primary prevention efforts and increase access to the full continuum of care and services for individuals with sub substance use disorders and their families. We at IHS understand the cost of this converging overdose emergency, the pandemic recovery, continual behavioral health crisis, and the strain on our healthcare system. We also recognize the overdose mortality data is rising and that American Indians and Alaska Native overdose mortality rates increased by 39 percent between 2019 and 2020. These mortality rates were the highest compared to any other racial or ethnic group. The impact of the fentanyl crisis is personal. In August, I partnered with the many regional state and tribal partners at the first National Opioid Summit hosted by the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board to address the fentanyl crisis in tribal communities. Collectively, we work to underscore that our approach should be centered on collaboration and support tribal practices that are already in place and are working. And we should emphasize community approaches that strengthen re resiliency. Our IHS leadership team is reminded of the importance of centering ourselves in a compassionate care models that in, that, and ensuring policy decisions are guided by the lessons of lived experiences. We have heard from our tribes that there is a lack of resources for detoxification detoxification services for addiction. Detoxification for opioids is challenging and medically complex. It is crucial to have specific funding allocated to support detoxification and recovery service. This is consistent with the travel message this committee heard last month. I know that my entire uh, testimony is, is in place, therefore in closing, I and my senior leadership and all of Indian Health Service recognize the importance of working side by side with tribes and tribal leaders to develop comprehensive plans for addressing the opioid crisis in Indian country. But we also recognize that each community plan includes strategies that work for each community. In September, I joined the secretary as of SAMHSA and other HHS colleagues at, at the Secretary's Tribal Advisory Meeting in South Dakota to consult with tribes and discuss our work in Indian Country. And just last week, we continued this dialogue with tribal leaders. As IHS combats the opioid crisis, we will continue to work hand in hand with all of our HHS colleagues to maximize resources for Indian Country. We also have partnered with other federal agencies beyond the department, including the Department of the VA, Agriculture, and the department agencies of my fellow witnesses sitting next to me today. I value the ongoing support of the federal partners and the critical work in tribal communities. 
Thank you for your commitment and welcome any additional opportunities to work together across the government and with Congress to enhance programs and find solutions and resources to address the needs across Indian country. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. Ms. Walder, please proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the devastating effects of the nationwide fentanyl crisis continues to have in Indian country across the United States. The Department of Justice is committed to working in collaboration with tribal, federal, state, and local partners across Indian country to respond to the fentanyl crisis, both through law enforcement action and supportive resources and prevention strategies. While federal prosecutors have been prosecuting drug trafficking cases for many years, the nature and scope of drug trafficking has changed dramatically with the rise of illicit fentanyl and other synthetic opioids. Traffickers can produce limitless amounts of illicit fentanyl if they have the appropriate chemicals and equipment, generating an unprecedented health crisis. Fentanyl overdoses are the leading cause of opioid-related deaths throughout the United States. American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians are on the front lines of the fentanyl epidemic. The drug-related overdose death rate for Native Americans significantly exceeds the national rate. In the Eastern District of Washington, we have seen firsthand how fentanyl and other drugs have affected our four tribal communities, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, the Kalispell Tribe, the Spokane Tribe, and the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation. Together, these tribal nations make up a landmass larger than the state of Connecticut. Much like other crises facing Native American populations, such as increased levels of domestic abuse, the climate crisis, violent crime, and the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people, Native Americans in the Eastern District of Washington are disproportionately impacted by the fentanyl epidemic in Indian country. In just two large takedowns this year, we seized approximately 161,000 fentanyl lace pills intended for distribution on the Colville Indian Reservation and approximately 120,000 fentanyl lace pills just outside the Yakima Nation. The department recognizes the widespread availability and misuse of drugs in Indian country, coupled with drug trafficking groups operating in Indian country, contribute to the high rates of crime on reservations. Every United States attorney with Indian country responsibilities has worked to develop strategies to address both drug trafficking crimes in Indian country and the violent crimes that are associated with drug trafficking and substance abuse disorder. The United States attorney's offices rely on investigations coordinated by tribal, federal, state, and local partners, including the FBI's Safe Trails Task Forces that conduct many of the drug investigations in Indian country. Tribal law enforcement provides invaluable assistance and intelligence related to drug trafficking in tribal communities. These task forces allow investigations to move beyond an individual tribal community and target drug traffickers prior to their arrival in Indian country. Our office has prosecuted significant fentanyl cases through these partnerships. Though these criminal prosecutions are an important tool for addressing the fentanyl crisis in Indian country, we must embrace a multifaceted strategy that includes education, community outreach, and increased resources to combat substance use and misuse. Within our district, we have partnered with DEA's Operation Engage initiative, a comprehensive community level approach that bridges public health and public safety. Last summer, Operation Engaged worked with the Spokane Tribe of Indians through the Boys and Girls Club to host a day of fun activities focused on making healthy choices and increasing drug prevention and awareness. Future events led by tribal youth are planned for later this winter. We have also worked closely with the Spokane Alliance for Fentanyl Education, which partners with our office, law enforcement, and community organizations to host public events raising awareness about the dangers of fentanyl and offering supportive services. The department is also dedicated to improving programs to assist tribal members that are re-entering the community following periods of confinement. Next year, the department's Bureau of Justice Assistance will be holding tribal intergovernmental re-entry workshops to identify critical services needed to reduce recidivism and victimization. I am proud of the investigative and prosecution efforts in our district and the other Indian country districts throughout the United States to remove fentanyl from Native American communities. 
we will continue to work in partnership with tribal, federal, state, and local partners to effectuate a multifaceted approach and response to the fentanyl epidemic. We appreciate this committee's focus on this devastating issue and are committed to working with you going forward. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you very much. Mr. Melville, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee. My name is Glenn Melville. I'm an enrolled member of the Makah Tribe of Northwest Washington, and I serve as the Deputy Bureau Director for the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Justice Services. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the fentanyl crisis affecting Native communities throughout the United States. The United States has a trust relationship with each of the 574 federally recognized tribes. As a part of that relationship, we have a trust obligation to protect that continued existence of Indian tribes and the physical security, physical security of their citizens. BIA plays a crucial role in meeting this obligation. The Office of Justice Services employs 352 uniformed police officers and criminal investigators serving over 200 Indian communities across the country. We have several law enforcement supporting operations and functions, which include the Missing and Murdered Unit, Victim Assistance, Drug Enforcement, Internal Affairs, Land Mobile, program, land mobile Radio Program, Indian Highway Safety, Tribal Justice Support, and the Operation of the Indian Police Academy. The Office of Justice, Ser Office of Justice Services also conducts investigations that include, but are not, in, not limited to, violent crimes against persons, illegal narcotics, gangs, human trafficking, and border violations in Indian Country. We have a specialized division of drug, drug enforcement that track and investigate the distribution of illegal, illegal narcotics in Indian Country. The drug-related activity in tri tribal communities imposes health and economic hardship as a major contributor to the violent crime in Indian Country. Our Division of Drug Enforcement has identified methamphetamine and fentanyl as the biggest emerging drug threats to our tribal communities. Tribes have reported 1,590 fatal overdoses in fiscal year 2023 and 899 non-fatal overdoses. In addition to fentanyl, other synthetic opioids are becoming more prevalent, such as carfentanil. Carfentanil is used as a medical tranquilizer for large animals, including elephants. It is estimated to be 100 times more potent than fentanyl. So far, there has only been limited seizures of carfentanil in Indian country, but expert Experts estimate there are about 25 to 30 different chemical versions of fentanyl that are often more powerful and dangerous. So far, only one death in Indian country has been attributed to carfentanil. In response to the illegal drug epidemic, many tribal justice systems have incorporated traditional and culturally appropriate solutions to address the drug addictions within their communities through healing to wellness courts. Tribal healing to wellness courts are experiencing some successes in addressing behaviors and are seeing reduced recidivism rates. These successes, these success rates demonstrate that the tribes are the best suited to provide solutions to the challenges within their communities. The department supports the work of tribal justice systems to ensure the safety of their communities and people. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, but I'm going to actually go down the line. Um, at our hearing last month, uh, tribal leaders testified that producers and traffickers routinely target Indian reservations due to the jurisdictional maze and the resulting gaps in law enforcement. What are your agencies doing to reduce those gaps? I'll start with you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you for the question, uh, Chairman Schatz. I, I think that uh, there are clearly seams between some of the law enforcement efforts, but organizations like the HIDA that comes out of uh, the ONDCP are synchronizers of that kind of uh, effort, and they try to fill those gaps as best as possible. Yeah, I get the structure, and I, I'm not trying to be adversarial here. I get the structure, right? And that would be the concept. But then I hear from the tribal leaders who feel like best laid plans, right? That there still remain these gaps. So how do we, how do we close them on the ground? Well, uh, it, it's important for us to continue to uh, drive home the idea of the force multiplying impact of the multi-agency. Uh, in the HIDA program, we have uh, 33 HIDAs nationwide. 14 of them are directly engaged 
with uh, tribal nations across the United States and tribal law enforcement. Uh, we've actually had quite a bit of success in those 14. In those 14, they seized over 14, $414 million uh, in uh, assets over the last year. Uh, there are places for improvement, but I think that we're actually, our investments are being well spent so far. Ms. So. Thank you for that question, Chairman. So the, the work that we are doing at the Indian Health Service is tr collaborating across HHS first. I wanna make sure that all of my colleagues at, at HHS understand the challenges of Indian country that I referenced in my earlier statement about the trip out to South Dakota. For, for some of my colleagues, that's first time out in Indian country. So understanding some of the challenges, the distances that, that our people have to drive and the limited resources that we have to address this is the first step. Then there are other uh, tools that we are building now and continue to build with our tribal partners to talk about and to develop strategies by which we can address these and working very closely with our tribal partners for each community because it's not a one size fits all. And so looking at that, utilizing the resources that we have to make sure that they are put out there in Indian country to, again, work with our partners to develop the best practices that can be shared across Indian country. So for you in particular, and I'm going to get to Ms. Ms. Waldorf, but, but, but to, for you in particular, you have the kind of inter and intra agency stuff, right? Because you have SAMHSA and some other agencies that may not have deep familiarity with working with, with, um, with Indian country. So you kind of have to work within your sort of parent agency and then across agencies. So I, I wanna, I, I'm gonna turn this into a question for the record, partly because I feel like these hearings can be a little bit of a gotcha, um, but I'm also not satisfied that we are filling the gaps. I think we're trying, I think we have, you know, it's sort of like, like a golf coach, I'm not a golfer, but uh, not a good golfer, but it's sort of like, keep your eye on the ball, like a bunch of, you know, a bunch of things that we ought to be doing. Sure, we ought to be doing that, but executing that is the hard part. And I don't quite see the execution, not because I have special visibility, but because tribal leaders told me that, you know, as recently as last month. So I don't think we're there yet. I, this is not a personal criticism, but I do think we need to do a little more work in this space. Um, Ms. Waldorf. Thank you, Chairman. The Department of Justice and individual U.S. attorney's offices have jurisdiction to prosecute federal drug crimes. And there can be a jurisdictional uh, challenge in addressing other violent crimes on Indian reservations, depending on the jurisdictional makeup of each individual state. The United States attorney's offices, uh, consistent with Savannah's Act and the Department of Justice guidelines, each uh, office works very closely with the tribal partners in their district. And for every tribe, we develop an operational plan to ensure that we can fill any jurisdictional gaps and have appropriate investigative resources available so that we can build cases and have them charged federally as appropriate. In my remaining time, is that something that you are doing in the Eastern District or that every U.S. attorney is, uh, is doing as a matter of DOJ policy? Chairman, both. In uh, the Department of Justice, every United States Attorney's Office has uh, a operational plan for working with each individual tribe for which they consult with the tribes to get valuable input to ensure that the tribe is weighing in on what are the largest needs for that community so that the United States Attorney's Office can be responsive to those needs. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you. Chairman, thank you to our witnesses. I want to start with you, Deputy Director uh, Cohen. Um, you know, I've, I've been a big supporter of what Haida does. I think we've we've seen some some results overall in Alaska. Um, you mentioned in your written testimony that the Haida Tribal Task Force uh, across the country been able to seize 414 million in illicit drugs, cash, and other assets from traffickers. Um, in total, all Haidas have seized an estimated $22 billion just in 2022 alone, allowing a return of $82 for every $1 spent on their budget. So it sounds like this is, uh, this is an effort that is worth funding. The question is, is we've, you've got a relatively large return there. Um, we've heard from everybody on this panel, and we, we, we know in this committee that the the the, those that are being most impacted right now uh, disproportionately are American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians. So you've got uh, $290 million going towards uh, the Haida program apparently in, in, in the FY24 budget. 
And I'm curious to know whether we have specific tribal priorities or set-asides included in that funding. So do you have a portion that is set aside for this population that we have identified as clearly being most impacted right now? My, my understanding of the, of the proposal for the 24 budget is that there is not a dedicated set aside. There is- Should there be? Given, I, given the statistics, given what we know, given the impact um, on Indian country, on Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians? I think it's something that's worth considering. The, the important thing to understand about the Haida program, as you've noted, is that um, there, is, there is genuine return on investment. Right. But most importantly is this idea that uh, the Haidas are locally driven law enforcement strategies. It is not Washington telling the field how to operate. Um, so what you have is 33 Haidas across the United States, which are bringing together federal, local, state, and tribal law enforcement, and more pointedly for this hearing, uh, in, in 14 instances, tribal law enforcement directly partnering with law enforcement to create the force multiplier that I mentioned a moment ago. And it, the fact that they can actually look at what's going on in their community and try to tailor their law enforcement approach is critically important to us. So let me, let me ask also then um, to you, we understand that the White House is developing this clearinghouse for, for tribes to apply for federal funding. Um, we hear very clearly that you've got tribal leaders commenting that it's been hard um, to access the federal resources. It's a, it's a cumbersome process, apparently. When is this clearinghouse expected to go live? And what, what have we done to make sure that the processes, processes are easier for the tribes to apply for the funding? So uh, at last year's tribal summit, we heard a lot of feedback from the tribes that it was very difficult for them to manage grants.gov and figure out all these different locations to gather resources. So the White House has launched this effort to try to create this clearinghouse. We are in the midst of doing that. I don't have a, a date for you today. I could try to get back to you with a little bit more fidelity, but we are working very hard to ensure that that clearinghouse is the user-friendly clearinghouse that we've heard from the field that we need. Well, From an I, ONDCP perspective, we are going to make sure that ONDCP resources are in that clearinghouse. Uh, and then we also have at ONDCP a forward-facing uh, uh, location where tribes can go to find all drug-related, narcotics-related grants. Well, and, and, and again, we hear this a lot. We, we put in place these programs, uh, we fund these programs, and then it is, it's just hard for those on the ground, for the tribes to actually be able to access them. So we may as well just be, just be putting it out there and, and, and putting a glass wall um, in terms of access. So we've got to address that. So I would urge you to, to move on this clearinghouse to make this process easier. I, I, I tell you, and this is, more, this is not necessarily a question to anyone, but I, I, I come from a state where the only way in, the only way in for these drugs is when they come through the mail and when they come on an airplane on somebody's body. It's two ways because you're not driving it in. Um, you know, very few are, are, are boating it in. Our reality is we know that it's being flown in. And the fact that it's getting into these tiny, tiny, tiny little villages where the only way in is that bush carrier. And knowing that in that cargo hold or on that person are hundreds, maybe a thousand fentanyl pills that could wipe out every single person in that village and then some, that we can't, we can't figure out how we can address the flow into these rural communities. It's, it's, it's killing us in a way that is just, it's, it's beyond, it's beyond comprehension, really. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I'm kind of going to follow you, the two of you, in this line of questioning and just keep digging on why this is such a prevalent problem for the populations that we're talking about and uh, Mr. Melville, it's good to know that you're enrolled macaw because it means you know what remote is and how remote Indian country can be. I want to welcome the Yakama Nation who is here too in the audience. 
the amount of volume that we're uncovering in Indian country in various reservations, whether you're talking about the Colville and 160,000 plus pills for a population of about 7,000 people of enrolled members or Yakima or some of these other places, says to me that it's not just the population that they're after, that perhaps this is also a location to run operations out of because there aren't enough law enforcement in the region. Is, are, are we seeing data on this? We had this big bust up in Lummi, and Lummi very close to the Canadian border. We needed the help of the FBI to bust up that ring. So are we seeing people not just preying on this population, which they clearly are preying on this population, as Senator Murkowski described, but in addition, is it just a good place to operate their facilities from? Does anybody have a comment on that? Mr. Mr. Melville. Thank you, Senator. Uh, absolutely. So there is a, a well-known fact uh, in the Mexican cartels that if you can go on to an Indian reservation and work your way into an Indian reservation, that that's an area that they know that they can try to utilize and, and, and manipulate because they know that the tribal police officers, they're only really you know in charge or... or looking at the tribal police there, our tribal members, um, visitors, you know, there's the myriad of jurisdiction everywhere you go. Uh, Washington is especially uh, uh, difficult well, with tribal jurisdiction, state jurisdiction, federal jurisdiction. So they figured out that that's a, that's a place that they want to try to go and get a foothold. And uh, it's very, very difficult in some of these remote areas for these task forces to be able to operate. Because as soon as you drive onto the Makai Indian Reservation, everybody knows you're there already. There's one way in, one way out. Um, and so any strange cars come in that they're not known, people talk about it. Um, if you're driving a SUV that looks like a government vehicle, you're not gonna be doing, being able to do much um, uh, surveillance. So uh, it, things, our uh, drug division is very, very, um, intuitive and, and inventive on the way that they try to get into those areas and try to uh, work with the, the tribes and the, and the task forces to, to try to root that out. And so that's one of the things that they work on, but it's very, very difficult um, area to work in. Anybody else on that point? Yes. Thank you, Senator. There are certainly challenges in addressing the trafficking of drugs in rural communities, and you've identified a lot of them. The same strategies that we have found uh, throughout rural communities in eastern Washington have been effective in addressing drug trafficking on our tribal lands as well. And that is really trying to have, uh, using resources like Haida and our task force, uh, Safe Trails task forces, so that we have accurate information from our tribal law enforcement members because they really know what's going on on the ground. And so if those task force, uh, those Tribal law enforcement members can be either task force officers or have the special law enforcement commissions. Those are extremely valuable tools for us to be able to bring federal prosecutions effectively. Well, Senator uh, Mullen and I both have sponsored legislation, the Tribal Law Enforcement Parity Act, which would help tribes with law enforcement self-governance contracts in retaining law enforcement. And so certainly support that. I certainly support more resources for local task force bottom up, but I was also trying to get at just this notion that not only are they preying on a population, they're also finding a good place to hide. Is that correct? There are challenges in rural communities, and we have that throughout the Eastern District, um, both in and around the Yakima area in the Yakima Valley, as well as in North uh, East Washington, where there are rural communities that can be areas to hide those drugs. What we do to try to uh, address that and to effectively prosecute these cases is having the most effective information sharing that we possibly can, which is using all of our information sharing resources such as HIDA, our task forces, and our DEA and BIA uh, cross-designated uh, partners. And just to be clear, what is the data change that we need to do that you think is, who, who do you think needs to get us better data? We can always be uh, partnering with this committee to try to provide the, the data information uh, that, that we can. We're working with our tribal partners on gathering that information and would be happy to support this uh, committee's interest in additional information about the impact of fentanyl in our Indian country communities. 
Thank you. I know my, I know my time's expired, Mr. Chairman, but I do think that um, improving the data connection with something the Northwest Indian Health Board out of Portland has talked about, and I know leaders here that we need to we'll get something for the record asking Director Cohen about that. Thank you. Senator Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this, this hearing. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to be raised in any country my whole life, still live there and uh, raise my kids there uh, to this day. And uh, the opioid crisis, which started this whole drug crisis, as led to the fentanyl crisis, uh, is touched all of us. All of us that live in any country, we all have family members that it's touched um, very close. Most of us would probably say we have family members that have been locked up uh, because of a, a use of drugs or they got cut up worse. And so it's very personal to me, and I was happy to, to work with the Trump administration on trying to address this. Uh, and um, and I, I thought we went a pretty, pretty, good, uh, pretty good way on actually just identifying some of the issues. And in fact, in front of me, I have a very detailed 30-page report uh, to Congress from BIA on the Opioid uh, Reduction Task Force that was uh, put in in 2018 and, and 2019. These are two detailed pages right here, and I'd like to submit it for record if that's okay, Chairman. Uh, and and I, I will, I'll tell you that I haven't heard anything, and I, this is no backhand because Indian country is bigger than politics. It's it's not a Republican thing. It's not a Democrat thing. In fact, most of us say, just get the heck out of our way. Let's live our lives. That's what we've always wanted to do. But uh, but I haven't heard anything from this administration. Not a word. And and I helped with this task force. I helped uh, bring some reality to it. I, I, I brought up different law enforcement through the Cherokee Marshals or uh, Light Horse or whatever task force it was to deal directly with them. And I'm just, I'm at a loss. And so, uh, so I've got a couple of questions for you. And, and one of them is really, who's running the opioid task force for OGS right now? Or OJS, I guess, not OGS, OJS. Thank you, Senator. Uh, right now, the opioid task force uh, really hasn't been um, something that's been followed up on as much as uh, should have. And, uh, and that's a problem. It's a huge problem. This isn't politics. This is about our families. I get asked almost every tribal member out here, how many of y'all know that their uh, grandparents are raising the third generation of their kids? Not their grandkids, their great-grandkids now. Because two generations have been lost. I see heads bobbing everywhere. Let me bob my head. Uh, I, have, I have three adopted children right now because of drugs that, that came from ICWA, Cherokee tribal members. And we have, a, we have an administration that, that says they're f for Indian country, but this task force was put in place and it was being pretty dang effective. And no one's heading it up now? How are you going after a fentanyl if you're not going after op opioids? They're a heck of a lot easier to get your hands on. And it's the foundation. Does anybody argue that point? It's the foundation to these drugs? Because the opioid is where the accidental overdose took place. It's where they accidentally got addicted. It's because they were prescribed by IHS, IHS doctors after a surgery or a back pain or an injury. And they took it according to the doctor's recommendations and yet we all know after 7 to 10 days, 30% of the population is going to be dependent on it. And then when they quit getting that, they go on to fentanyl, yet we don't have a task force for it anymore. There's a problem. Have we seen any arrest from OJS? Uh, do we know what the arrests are for um, uh, uh, underneath the arrest for seizures on the southwest border since 2018 and 2019? Do we know how many people have been arrested or drugs been seized? Sir, I don't have the numbers in front of me about who's been arrested. Yeah. But we've done an amazing job of this year uh, under this administration working on prosecution, uh, not only just catching uh, people that are coming across with drugs, but okay, also... Okay, well, let me, I'll switch that question. Ma'am, how many of how many have, have which to have been convicted now? I don't have that data in front of me. So can we get that data? Better, but we can absolutely provide information regarding... Because convictions. I can get pretty close to what's happened in our country. Most of them are going unprosecuted. The rest are being, they're being arrested, 
but they're not being prosecuted. In fact, when you deal with the FBI, the FBI says, listen, we're just trying to deal with the most heinous crimes in any country right now. Is that different than what you're hearing? No? Go ahead and be loud for the record so I can hear that. No. No. So we're not even prosecuting these individuals. That's a problem. That's a huge, huge problem. So we're up here and we're talking about fentanyl. We're talking about the opioid crisis and we're doing nothing for it. This is all dog and pony show because I'm living in it. And it's worse now than it's been. And this is not, guys, I'm, I'm, I, for my Democrat colleagues, this isn't about politics to me. I could care less because this is my backyard. This is my home. This is my family. It has nothing to do with Republicans, nothing to do with Democrats. This has to do with getting the drugs off our streets and you can't seize it and think it's not going to come back if you don't prosecute. If you don't get the, the offenders off the ground, I'm not talking about the users, I'm talking about the dealers. If you don't get them off our streets, what good does it do? In fact, it just breeds more dealers because they know they won't be prosecuted. It's a hole and we need help with it. And I just, I, I'm, I, I'm just trying to help, sir, I know over my time, I'm just trying to help open people's eyes because maybe you don't see it because you don't live it. And that's why I'm saying I do. And I am willing to work with anybody on this, including this administration, to just help get these. I, Ma'am, I know you want to do your job. I know you do. So this isn't on you. And sir, I know you do too. Help us help you. What do we need to do? I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto. Well, let me follow that. Um, because I, I, I absolutely I agree with you. So he, here's what I know. Um, Nevada is 110,000 um, square miles. There's 3 million people live there. There's 28 tribal communities. Uh, I know, working there in law enforcement, that the Mexican cartels use the distance of uh, vast deserts and areas to peddle their drugs. And they get into some of our tribal communities. I also know of the 28 tribal communities, not all of them have law enforcement. And they rely on BIA. My challenge is with BIA, and this is what I want to hear, is they're under-resourced and understaffed. In Nevada, the BIA comes from three different regions. And just recently, I was with the Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone tribe, which is on the border of Nevada and Oregon, talking with the tribe and the BIA agents. There's not enough of them to cover that territory, those vast distances, and the other territory that they have to cover if they're coming from Arizona or California or wherever they're coming from. I also will tell you that every U.S. attorney's office, and I thank you for being here, but everyone's going to be unique and different. Some are, be, are very aggressive when it comes to staffing AUSAs when it, on uh, tribal communities and working with the FBI who are assigned to it to go after the crime there, and some are not. That's part of the problem. So my first question, I guess, to Mr. Melville is, be honest with us. Tell us you need more BIA agents, and what do you need to staff those BIA agents? And is that enough? I will add one final thing here. I just got off the phone this past week. We lost two police officers, NHP police officers, in southern Nevada. I'm going to be at the funeral tomorrow. And I was head, uh, talking with the head of our DPS. He literally wants to enter into an agreement to, with our, some of our tribes to be able to provide investigation and law enforcement, but BIA and Interior is blocking that. So uh, what is the answer here? If we can't have BIA be honest with us and tell us the resources you need to cover the territory, have our AUSAs, U.S. attorneys, our FBI agents, by the way, who are not tasked uh, all uh, enough resources to go after the, a lot of the drugs we see and the activity that, we have, that happens here, what do we do? And what do the tribes do? We also know the tribes, most of the crime is by non-Indians. And how do we handle that? So uh, we are all asking for answers. And that's why I have the Badges Act. That's why the Parity Act is here. That's why there's a lot of work trying to get at how do we staff this and address the, the challenges, the complexity of it. But I've always wanted BIA to be here, and I'm asking you, what do we need to do? You are understaffed. Tell us why. What is going on, and what, what else you need? Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'll be honest with you. The uh, issue of lacking law enforcement in Indian country is a lack of interest in being in law enforcement by qualified Indians that um, you know, 
don't really want to go into law enforcement, don't really want to be part of that anymore. We're uh, actively working with youth to try to bring in some interest to understand that law enforcement is not a bad career, that it's a place where you can serve your, your people and serve your, your country. So are you telling me that you have you have uh, open positions for BIA agents and you can't fill those positions? That is correct. And the reason why you can't fill those positions is because of a lack of interest or because the salary and the retention, the benefits are not enough? Oh, I'm working on the salary and benefits. We were, we were working on the uh, pay parity for um, our law enforcement officers. Uh, our police officers, when I took over, were uh, GS-083s. They t stepped out at uh, GS-8. We've now moved them to the 1801 series, a law enforcement officer, professionalized them to uh, the department standards, along with every other bureau in, or most every other bureau in uh, Department of Interior. And now they um, get out to, to GS-11 wages. So that's living wages for our police officers. That's for OJS direct service. Um, so... In the meantime, as you're trying to retain more officers to cover the territory that you need, even at the capacity that you have, do you need more officers, number one? And two, are you opposed to entering into agreements with local law enforcement, state law enforcement to help cover the territory when tribes don't have tribal law enforcement? Absolutely not, ma'am. I want uh, Indian country to be as safe as possible. I want um, departments, tribal, local, federal, everybody to be able to work together um, in cooperative agreements, in mutual aid agreements, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. If somebody needs police assistance, I don't want anybody to think, okay, what badge or what color uniform is coming to help me? All I'm getting is police service when I need it. So I know my time is up and thank you because I, 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 we're going to follow up. I, I want answers to all of this. So we are providing the resources we need. But let me ask um, Ms. Waldruff, thank you for being here. How many AUSAs do you have assigned to tribal communities? My office has uh, 40 AUSA positions, and I would say probably half of our AUSAs are doing work that impact our tribal nations. What does that mean? They're actually prosecuting cases? Yes. We okay. have prosecutors. Um, we have a dedicated uh, Indian country liaison mm -hmm. who is our, you know, on the ground uh, force talking with all of our tribal nations. And actually, I'm very excited to uh, be having one of the MMIP AUSA uh who is going to be hired in Eastern Washington, joining our team as well, serving the entire Western region to collaborate and to provide better resources for... And how many FBI agents are working with you for tribal communities? For our in entire region, we have two SSRAs, and I would say it's about nine to 10 FBI agents serving our tribal communities in Eastern Washington. Thank you. That is more, uh, thank you. And I, I know I'm done and I'm, I'm going to run over right time, but that not every AUSA, not every U.S. Attorney's Office uh, devotes that entire, what you have done to tribal community. Everyone is unique and some are missing out on providing that type of um, uh, enforcement and prosecution. And that's part of the challenge we see. So thank you. Senator Hoven. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks for holding the meeting today. I want to follow up uh, on uh, what uh, Senator Cortez Masto is talking about here. Uh, last month, uh, we had uh, the chairman, uh, Jamie Azure, of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians testified in front of this committee, uh, and he said that there's one, one, and this is going to be for you, Mr. Melville, one BIA uh, drug agent stationed to patrol all of our reservations in North Dakota. We have five reservations spread out over thousands of miles, two of which we share with uh, South Dakota. Turtle Mountain's actually up on the Canadian border. Uh, but so to address this, the North Dakota legislature authorized additional North Dakota Bureau of Criminal Investigation agents to work with and near tribal communities. So uh, last year, uh, Spirit Lake entered into an MOU with the state of North Dakota, agreeing to share resources and information pertaining to law enforcement operations. My question is, why has the department taken over three years to review an MOU between uh, the Turtle Mountain Tribe and the state of North Dakota to address law enforcement and public safety issues on the Turtle Mountain Reservation when we have that shortage of BIA agents? Why would, it, why would you delay that for three years? Thank you for the question, sir. Um, so I'll let you know that the uh, agreements have been reviewed by our solicitor's office. And that's 
tends to, uh, when you have solicitors get involved, it's, it takes a little bit longer. I guarantee that we have uh, our folks on the ground trying to work together no matter what, if they have an MOU wow. or not. Three years, do you think that's acceptable with three years? No, absolutely you not. commit to me, you'll do something about it. And again, that's just our experience. Well, there are more than 700 reservations around the country. Will you commit to me that you're going to do something about this? Absolutely. Okay. Along those lines, we've set up a, a law enforcement uh, training center for BI agents at Camp Grafton, which is our National Guard site in, uh, in North Dakota. I think something like 50% of the jobs in the upper Great Plains for BIA law enforcement officers are vacant. Places like Montana, Alaska, North Dakota, you know. And so the whole idea is because it formerly all had to go down to New Mexico for training, that a lot of the folks from the you know, northern uh, uh, tribes and reservations didn't want to do that. They wanted to stay closer to home. That's why we set up this center. Uh, so, you know, what can you do to help us continue to recruit and get more of these uh, BI law enforcement uh, candidates uh, to, uh, to our training center. Actually, the reality is I think we're already running over capacity. So it's really what can you do to help us continue to staff up and resource it to handle more of these agents when we need so many of them across all of our Northern Plains reservations. Uh, what, we, what can we do? Uh, you know, we can always uh, be looking for uh, additional positions. We're constantly recruiting. We're reaching out to the tribal colleges. Uh, we've even started uh, working with um, high school age kids. This, um, I think the biggest thing is to help us resource it. We're, we already have more applicants than we can handle. And these are folks that w will fill these Northern Plains BIA law enforcement positions. So we need your help. I think under the Badges Act, uh, we have a proposal that the Bureau of Indian Affairs would be able to do their own background investigations, which would speed up the hiring and, and getting boots on the ground a whole lot quicker uh, than having Yeah, but what through. I'm looking for is help getting them through the, to, the, to and through the academy resources there. Were you willing to work with my staff on that? Absolutely. Okay, and then um, I want to ask about the... Uh, Commitments and uh, border for uh, Mr. Cohen. Um, why aren't we doing more to stop the influx of fentanyl across the border, as well as just the flow of people across the border, and um, you know the, the flow of drugs, uh, not only to every community in this country, but to every reservation? What do you think ought to be done, or do you think it's acceptable what's going on right now, Senator? We've got. Uh, Record numbers of personnel on the border. Um, something like 85% of CBP is, is facing south. And that's actually paying off. The, the, the teams at CBP um, are making record seizures of illicit narcotics coming across the border. Uh, some 547,000 pounds of illicit narcotics uh, last year. Of that, 28,000 pounds was illicit fentanyl. Um, so we're making sort of historic commitment there and we're seeing some historic return. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that's should the should the metric be how much you seize, or how many more people come here illegally, and how many how much more drugs come here more drugs come here illegally. So if you're if you're getting if you're seizing more all the time, and there's more and more coming into our communities, you consider that success? Well, the 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 metric for me is reducing overdose death. I mean, that's the north star for me. That's the north star for the president for this administration. It isn't reducing the amount of drugs that actually flow into the country. The, the metric is trying to reduce from 110,000 Americans that passed away last year due to drug poisoning, 70% uh, of which due to fentanyl poisoning, is to try to get that number down as, as much as possible. How are we fact, doing on that? How are we doing on that? Well, the, the fact is that we are now seeing a level off in that overdose rate after three plus years of increases up through FY21, calendar year 21. Uh, we've now seen a leveling off. And that gives us the chance to find a plateau. I, I'm hopeful that that plateau gives us decrease. Uh, we won't know unless we continue to follow our historic investments with more investment. Final follow-up, Mr. Chairman. So you feel that the flow of drugs and people, including drug dealers coming across the border now, you feel you're, you're uh, making progress on that? That's what you're telling us? Well, 
I'm focused on the amount of narcotics coming into the United States and the illicit fentanyl coming into the United States and trying to seize as much of that as I can. Every ounce, every pound, every package of fentanyl that we seize along the border is not getting to Americans that are ultimately overdosing. So that is progress to me. Senator Smith. Thank you, Senator uh, Schatz, Chair Schatz and Ranking Member. Um, I can just tell from this conversation that people feel really strongly about this, and we feel strongly about it because we know that it is such a huge issue in our states. And, you know, I can't remember the time that we've held two hearings um, so close to one another like this, and I think it just underscores the importance of this. And I can tell you that I hear from tribal leaders in Minnesota all the time about the devastation of the fentanyl crisis for every single family. Just as Senator Mullen said, it touches everybody one way or another. Um, um, just last week, I heard a story about a situation in the Sisseton Wahpeton, uh, uh, at Sisseton Wahpeton in South Dakota, just across the border from Minnesota, and the just terrible violence that was driven by drug trafficking. So, um, I also just want to say, Mr. Chair, that um, just a note on our Minnesota experience. While there is a huge problem with figuring out how to do prosecutions for these crimes, um, there are some examples where there's been some success. This has been a story that I have heard over and over again from Red Lake Nation, for example. The sort of revolving door that happens with non-native people coming onto tribal land, committing crimes, drug crimes, sex trafficking crimes, and then just basically walking away. Um, and um, an example of what we are doing that I think is working is the U.S. attorney in Minnesota, and, and Minnesota, Andy Luger, went up to Red Lake, understood what was going on, and as a result of that and their consultation with Red Lake, was able to hire five special prosecutors uh, for Indian Country in Minnesota with new resources from the Biden administration to be able to get at that prosecution. So it is not a panacea, but it is helping to be able to make um, an improvement. But what I want to focus on is this question of how, um, on the other hand, if tribes have special tribal criminal jurisdiction, that they are able to prosecute these crimes in ways that will also make a big difference. So, um, uh, Deputy Director Melville, um, I know that the special tribal criminal jurisdiction goes through the DOJ, but I'd like to ask you about the lessons that you've learned from that program that we could apply here. You know, I've worked on this with many on this committee with these, um, uh, particularly with the VAWA reauthorization. So what can you tell us about the impact of that special tribal criminal jurisdiction on the missing and murdered indigenous people issue? And what can we learn from that that might guide us as we try to get more progress in this area? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I can tell you that any time that uh, the tribes get special authorization or special jurisdiction, that they take care of it. They, they go after it incredibly uh, hard because they've been taken away that, that jurisdiction from be before. Right. They finally have a point where they can f do something themselves. They, they can see the, the product of, of what they're putting forward, and that really empowers them. That They're very, very, very uh, emotional about what— and yeah. w what they're going, what they've got going on, and uh, you know, by giving them uh, that ad additional jurisdiction that was taken away uh, under Public Law 280 or or um, uh, Oliphant, um, that all of a sudden you know that, that gives those tribes uh, buy-in, and they are absolutely uh, taking care of it. So um, it, it helps quite a bit. So some lessons that we've learned for providing special criminal jurisdiction on missing and murdered indigenous people, we could think about applying that uh, to creating a, um, you know, a, 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 a drug crime special jurisdiction that it could have some of the same um, positive results, you think? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, uh, Director Cho, I just wanted to, so I just wanted to ask you, when you were first nominated, we discussed my hope to create a special behavioral health program in Indian country model on the successful special diabetes program. What we are talking about, you know, there's a great interplay, of course, between behavioral health issues and substance use disorder issues. And so um, I'm wondering if you could comment briefly on how you think a special behavioral health program um, could it help address the fentanyl crisis in Indian country. Thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, two things that I would say. One is that, of course, building on the special diabetes program, I really 
uh, incorporating and and the foundation of that was built in Indian country yes. that each communities were able to to build what they need for their communities and it's the same place that we need to start for behavioral health, or that's where we're at right now with behavioral health, that tribal leaders, tribal communities are taking control of their, of what it is that they need for their specific communities. I see that Indian Health Service or the federal government becomes a support. We, we are technical advisors at some point, and we are no longer and should not be driving what uh, is appropriate for, for, for Indian country. And this has been something that we are working on. So as we're looking more at strategies, building strategies, strategies that we can offer, partnering with people like the Portland Area Indian Health Board and other national organizations to help us build strategies that can be incorporated at the local level to best address this. It has to be following the same model as the SCPI. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's very good guidance for us. Appreciate it. Senator Daines. Chairman Schatz, thank you, as well as Vice Chairman Mikowski. Uh, this committee recently heard firsthand from tribal leaders about the devastating consequences of fentanyl. Fentanyl flowing into Indian country, which I think in many ways is ground zero for the overall fentanyl crisis in our nation. In fact, we heard a simple message from Councilman Bryce Kirk, who was here from the Fort Peck Reservation of Montana. To paraphrase what he said, he says, we need to shut down the southern border. That's what he said, to stop these dangerous drugs from entering our country. There must be real policy changes to make the border more secure. It's all tied together. And until we do that, I'm very concerned that lives will continue to be lost, communities will continue to be destroyed, law enforcement overwhelmed by fentanyl and other drugs that are being brought into the United States. When I spend time out on, on uh, our reservations in Montana, talk to law enforcement, talk to tribal leaders, I'll tell you, from the time that fentanyl crosses the Rio Grande until it gets to a reservation in Montana is 48 to 72 hours. In Montana, Native Americans are dying from overdoses at a two to one ratio. Montana law enforcement broke last year's record of fentanyl seizures in just the first six months of this year, and it continues to climb. It's not a mystery where these drugs are coming from. They're coming across the wide open southern border. Deputy Director Cohen, the Biden administration's national drug control strategy promised bold action to combat the fentanyl crisis. The Office of National Drug Control Policy cites a mandate from the president to stop drug trafficking organizations that bring fentanyl into our country. My question is, do you think the administration is doing enough to stop the flow of illegal drugs across the southern border? Senator, I, I share your concerns. Uh, the fact that uh, overdose rates are as high as they are in the indigenous communities uh, is difficult. That, excuse me? Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, as I, mo I mentioned a moment ago in response to Senator Hoven's question, the fact that overdose deaths continue to, to rise in that community is the North Star. And uh, there is, a, there is a, um, a historic commitment by this administration. I appreciate that there is that difficulty, but the fact is that um, we have uh, put record amounts of resources to the southwest border. We are seizing record amounts of narcotics as it's coming across the border. One of the reasons that I urge this committee to pass the supplemental is that I need to continue to keep my foot on the gas to continue to seize in do, the do way you, that- do you, have, you, have you been down on the southern border before? Yes, sir. Have you talked to Border Patrol? Yes, sir. Do you ask them about, as they think about uh, the, the resources stretch, the zero sum of their, tr they've apprehended over 8 million illegals coming across the border, how that somehow is part of the calculus in terms of the stretched, stretched capabilities? Why Border Patrol agents now are starting to retire at record levels because they were, they were hired to protect the border, not process illegals? Have you had those conversations with them? Uh, the focus of my conversations with CBP uh, rank and file as well as leadership is all about doing everything this, that this administration can possibly do to reduce the flow of narcotics. Do you think, it, you think it, it, it distracts the Border Patrol's mission in trying to stop illegal drugs by having to process some now 8 million illegals and plus 1.6 million known gotaways since the president took office? I, I, I'm hesitant to conflate border security, immigration policy, and narcotics trafficking. This is not immigration policy. <laughs> this is about an out of control southern border that's wide open. Do you think the administration is doing enough? 
I think that uh, with our historic investments and with the focus uh, on narcotics trafficking, the fact that we are seizing as much as we are seizing is saving American lives. And that's the metric. I, I, uh, I, I, I understand and I respect your opinion. And certainly somebody out there trying to help. And I, I, don't, I wouldn't trade you jobs right now. Uh, but I think that's the wrong metric to look at. It's just because we have absolutely flood. It's like saying we, you know, we, we, if we started measuring how many illegals we've apprehended at the border and say we're proud of the fact we've seized you know, 8 million since the president took office, that's not a record to be proud of. So I'll move on. Uh, Director So. It's my understanding that the relationship between your office, the IHS, and the Blackfeet tribe has deteriorated to the point that the Blackfeet leadership has called for new leadership. The government-to-government -government relationship between IHS and the Blackfeet is broken, and unfortunately, I am not seeing actions being taken to resolve the issue, from the lack of doctors to treat basic medical concerns, to provide res resources necessary. Uh, the issue, certainly the harm done by Dr. Stanley Weber on the reservation, IHS has failed the Blackfeet nation. Do you believe the IHS is doing enough for the Blackfeet people to fulfill its trust responsibility? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Of course, every relationship with tribal leaders is absolutely important for the work that I do at the Indian Health Service. I cannot do my job without working very closely with the with all tribes, including the Blackfeet Black tribe. Have, have you been to the Blackfeet Reservation I, I have, in your capacity uh, as director? I, as, as director. No, I, I was planning to go there, and then we did not make it there. I have, I will continue to, and I have continued to have conversations and outreach to the tribe to make sure that we continue dialogue and conversations I, about the health care services at the, right. on their community. On behalf of the Blackfeet tribe, I would uh, request if you would make that trip, meet with the tribal leaders, meet with the people there on the reservation, and hear it firsthand, because I'm hearing it. You should be able to make the same trip out to Montana and hear it from them. I have been out to Montana about four times. I will continue to do outreach with them. And, and yeah, Marcia, as director, though, the position you have now, Ask please the, go see the Blackfeet. Yes, sir. Thank you. Senator Tester. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member, for having this hearing. <clears throat> uh, the questions in the, uh, that have been asked here so far got to me thinking of the first time I came to an Indian Affairs meeting. It was when Byron Dorgan was chairman and Craig Thomas was ranking member. And one of the issues we were talking about was declination in Indian country and why there was such a high rate of declinations. Because quite frankly, uh, it's a problem and it's been a problem. Uh, and I'm not going to get political here, so I'm not going to talk about what a wonderful job Trump, or, uh, Trump has done or a wonderful job Biden has done. The truth is, this has been a train wreck for a long time. And um, through multiple administrations, through multiple uh, regardless which party has been in, in the White House. Uh, U.S. Attorney, uh, why has this been the case, and why has it continued to be the case? And are, are there any shining stars where we're actually seeing cases being prosecuted at the same rate as off-reservation cases? The department is committed to achieving public safety in Native American communities, and uh, I think one example that I can highlight as a success was actually a cross-jurisdictional effort between my office and the um, Montana U.S. Attorney's Office where we were able to share information very effectively with partnerships between DEA, BIA, and our tribal law enforcement partners to seize 160,000 fentanyl pills before they entered the Colville Reservation and made their way over into the Montana areas as well. So let me ask you... Um what, why is it this way? Is it? I, I know we've only got one FBI officer in Montana. Sounds like you've only got one FBI officer in North Dakota. Um, why is why is it that the declinations are so high? Everything is it? Is, is it? And I, I'm not. I don't want to throw the BI under the bus because, by the way, you guys need more people. There's no doubt about it. And if you, if we've got. In fact, I had a tribe in earlier this week, and I had a tribe in that I talked to on the phone right before Thanksgiving. We've got a minimum number of BIA agents, and 638 tribes are in the same boat. They don't have enough folks. And if you don't have law enforcement, you can't put the down the paper trail, and you can't have a good case to be able to get these folks convicted. Let's cut right to the chase. Is that the problem? 
Thank you, Senator. You've identified the challenges of law enforcement in bringing cases that can be prosecutable to the United States Attorney's offices. In the challenges we have with recruitment and retention on both uh, tribal reservations with 638 contracts or in the BIA, the department is trying to do all it can to fill those jurisdictional gaps and fill those law enforcement gaps. But, but a lot of this falls on us, making sure that the BIA has the resources it needs to be competitive. This is not pointed at you in any way whatsoever, uh, Mr. Uh, Melville. Uh, I'm just asking the question, how do your wages and benefits compare with the Highway Patrol? Thank you, Senator. Uh, they're getting better. But they're not close to them, are they? They're getting better. Okay, so when you get an agent trained up, a BIA agent, you know what they're going to look at going to? They're going to go to the Customs and Border Protection, or they're going to go to the county, or they're going to go to the Highway Patrol. This, By the way, this isn't your fault. This is our fault. The folks on this side of the rostrum. And it's not these folks that are the problem either, because every one of us understand that we've got to have money in the budget for the BIA to hire officers. And if they don't have the budget, and by the way, also in the budget for when a tribe 638s, that they're getting the same amount of money as you guys have to do the same kind of job. And so it's on us. What would you be a perspective on that? Don't want to throw us all the way under the bus, but you can throw us part of the way. Mr. Melville. You're exactly right, Senator. Absolutely right. I mean, uh, being able to compete with uh, the other departments out there, the, there's a shortage of law enforcement nationwide. When you have city police departments that are offering a $25,000 hiring bonus just for somebody who has law enforcement experience, of course, somebody that's going from a tribe or even the Bureau of Indian Affairs at one point would be tempted to go and, and get that money. And you combine that with a lack of housing? with schools that need attention in Indian country? And why are you gonna be able to out recruit anybody is the point. So we've got a lot of work to do. Just one thing for the record that I wanna put forth. The fentanyl that's coming into this country, some of it is coming in between the border stations, but the vast majority is coming through the border stations. We need technology. We have technology, by the way, that can determine that stuff and it's in a car or in a truck or in a hubcap or whatever it might be. And we need to get serious about doing technology and manpower to secure the southern border. But if we really want to do this, we got to quit making it a political talking point and get after it. Both sides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Tester. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our vice chair as well for this hearing. Um, Mr. Melville, um, as the hearing began, I had the honor of uh, handing a letter over to your staff, which I believe has since been shared with you. It's a letter from Mescalero Apache Nation in New Mexico dated August 30th. Um, they still haven't received a response from this letter and previous letters related to this. And Mr. Melville, I was hoping that I can uh, get maybe get a time frame when the agency might be able to get the, the tribe a response to that letter. Thank you, Senator. Absolutely. Uh, since we have received the letter uh, from the tribe, we've been working very, very closely with them, uh, sending folks in to uh, take a look at the programs, seeing what they can do, having more and more communication with the, with the tribe. Uh, the fact that a, a formal letter hasn't uh, gone back to them uh, is something I will need to follow up on. Is that something we can work on and get a formal response to the tribe? Absolutely, sir. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Melville. Um, in New Mexico, thousands of tribal members fell victims to an extensive sober home Medicaid fraud scheme in Arizona. Many were kidnapped from New Mexico and driven hundreds of miles to Arizona under the false promise of treatment. Then they were left there without any means to get home or any treatment whatsoever. The tragedy highlighted the dire need for increases in substance use disorder treatment. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I appreciate in your testimony that you said, quote, if it is easier to get drugs than it is to get treatment, we will never reduce overdose deaths, close quote. I appreciate that. Now, Ms. So, how is IHS increasing access to substance use disorder treatment so that people do not fall prey to these horrible frauds? And I'll just include that what I would add to Mr. Cohen's statement is also for alcohol-related deaths as well. But my question uh, to you, Ms. So, is um, what is IHS doing to increase access to substance use disorder treatment so that people don't fall prey to these horrible frauds? 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, this continues, of course, to be a, a challenge across the country to find places where where our people can go, specifically our people from Indian country. Uh, we do continue to work across across the agency to find places where we can we can um, support our our people to go. But many of this is also take integrating into the community level strategies that we can use to again help tribes use their what is working in their communities to build before we can if there if there's any delays to get them into treatment so we are looking at strategies and trying to find ways to do this the IHS community opioid intervention pilot project awarded 35 grants in 2021 a little over 16 million in funding appropriated by Congress including one to the Albuquerque area Indian Health Board of New Mexico but no new awards are available due to lack of funding Ms. So, yes or no, should Congress provide additional funding for this pilot grant program? Yes. Ms. So, yes or no, does the IHS support permanent authorization of this program? Yes. And Ms. So, what would be the impact of IHS's treatment work if Congress does not pass a domestic supplement with funding to combat the fentanyl crisis? Thank you, Mr. Senator. We are already behind, as as all of us are talking about here, with regards to strategies to to get in front of the opioid crisis. Uh, failing to fund the supplemental will continue to put us further behind. Mr. Waldriff, in your testimony, you mentioned that earlier this year, one of the largest ever seizures of narcotics in your district included thousands of rainbow color fentanyl tablets. The senator showed us a, a large photo of just one of those bags. You allege that a significant portion of the drugs were destined to the Colville Reservation and other Native American communities in surrounding areas. My question is, why are cartel operatives using tribal lands to transport and hide fentanyl? Thank you, Senator. The challenges that rural communities are facing for uh, addressing the crisis of fentanyl are serious, and we do see drug trafficking oper operations using rural communities as um, areas to stash drugs. The DEA is engaged in all efforts to ensure that our large drug trafficking organizations are being held accountable for the fentanyl that they're bringing into our communities. And there is information sharing that I it would absolutely encourage between our tribal law enforcement, our FBI, and our DEA to ensure that we're gathering appropriate information to not allow those drug traffickers to use any of our communities, particularly our tribal communities, as safe areas. It should not be. There's federal uh, prosecution uh, priorities around ensuring that these drug traffickers are being held accountable for that work. And Ms. Waldruff, in your testimony, you endorsed a multifaceted strategy to address the fentanyl crisis in Indian country. Does the multi multifaceted strategy include proactive steps the DOJ will, DOJ will take to address the crisis on missing and murdered Indigenous people? Absolutely, Senator. The dangers that we're seeing in our communities that are related to drug trafficking have so much crossover with violent crimes, including the root causes of missing and murdered indigenous people, and our efforts to prosecute both drug crimes and domestic violence, violent crimes, assaults, are all efforts to address the missing and murdered indigenous people crisis. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We thank all of our testifiers. And if there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up questions uh, for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks, and I want to thank all of you for your time, your testimony, and your hard work. This hearing is adjourned.